This conference will now be recorded. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge our CIMGTA West co-chairs, Mary Murray and Phil Canciller. And on behalf of the SIMGTA West, we would also like to thank our gold sponsors, SGS, for their support and continued sponsorship of our branch. SGS is the world's leading inspection, verification, testing and certification company, recognized as the global benchmark for quality and integrity. SGS provide a comprehensive range of analytical services using their network of state-of-the-art laboratories for a wide range of industries, specifically supporting the mining and metals industry through analytical, bench scale and pilot plant offerings. Sarah Wilson and Yasha Chaguli, both CIM office bearers, will be happy to receive your queries. Their details are on the CIM website. And if your company would also like to become a sponsor of the CIM GTA West branch, we would be delighted to hear from you. Before I introduce our speaker today, Nathan Williams, I'd like to draw your attention to the comments bar on your, your page. You'll see it's at the top right hand uh, corner and during Nathan's presentation you will have the opportunity of typing your questions into this comments bar. We will not be taking live questions. At the end of the presentation we'll have the Q&A where Nathan will answer your questions and please do continue typing your questions during this uh, Q&A session. Thanks, thanks Nathan. We are very happy to welcome Nathan Williams, who is the founder and CEO of MindSpider, a blockchain protocol for tracking responsibly sourced materials along the supply chain. MindSpider works with top companies such as Volkswagen, Google, Cisco, and Minso. Nathan has facilitated blockchain workshops as a visiting expert for the UNECE, as well as the World Economic Forum. He has been featured in no less than Bloomberg, Forbes, Huffington Post, and Wired Germany. What you didn't know about Nathan is that he has played guitar for 20 years, although he still considers himself somewhat of an amateur. In spite of that, he once made a blockchain-themed rap song and played it for Akon. Akon's reaction was, damn, I didn't expect it to be good. I'd listen to that in my car. So we, we have a multi-talented multi uh, celebrity with us today. Nathan also used to host a podcast called Analysis in Chains, where he interviewed founders of blockchain companies. While he no longer has the time, his podcasts are still available for you to enjoy on Spotify. Nathan, Nathan joins us all the way from Berlin, and it is my great pleasure, Nathan, to welcome you today on behalf of the CIM GTA West. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, quite an introduction. I almost sound impressed with uh, this uh, this Nathan fellow. He sounds quite more impressive than I feel. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for having me here. Uh, I understand that this is a lunch and learn and that uh, everybody is uh, uh, on their lunch break. It's a little bit later here in Berlin. Uh, we're approaching five o'clock. And um, I'm not sure what everyone's different level of understanding of blockchain is or about traceability, if you've had experience with it or if you haven't. Um, but what I thought I would do today is take you through a couple of ideas uh, to show sort of how I see the future of mining and how, uh, and how we can move away from uh, anonymous commodities and use this, uh, this new technology to get us toward more uh, of trusted products uh, where where we know a little bit more about what's go, what we're purchasing, what's going into our products, uh, and uh, and hopefully leading to a race to the top instead of a race to the bottom. Okay, and I'll try and keep it relatively concise so that we can have a discussion afterwards if there if there are questions. And I've got the chat window open, uh, e even though we're not doing uh, live questions. I can uh, see if anyone has any comments, questions, things they need clarified as we go. Sound good? I guess everyone's muted, so I'll assume that sounds good. So, <clears throat> let's see. Hello. Slow computer is slow. 
So I want to start with something that um, that was said at the World Economic Forum about a year ago, which uh, Larry Fink, uh, executive of BlackRock, uh, made a statement saying that he was expecting sustainability to be the norm instead of the exception when they were choosing their uh, investment targets. And this was huge because BlackRock is, uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, the largest uh, investment fund out there and where they go, everyone else tends to follow. Um, that signaled sort of a watershed moment where, uh, uh, where sustainability in, in a lot of companies' minds moved from being an afterthought or something that maybe they would use a little bit for marketing purposes something that would help them secure investment, something that was important for their social license to operate, something that would be important for their continued viability as a business. And the thing is, uh, right now, we're in a situation where, where we have uh, a crisis of a lack of information that uh, when we buy metals or when we buy products, uh, we have no idea what's going on in the production of these products because uh, because supply chains are opaque. And I'm sorry, my uh, my thing seems to not be uh, full screen, but I'm going to just continue in this way. That's all right. Um, it's very strange what it's doing. There we go. So, this, this is causing a shift, and this is the beginning of a shift in the world towards sustainable products. We've got opportunities and threats in this area, but we're already seeing big entities start to make strategic decisions in order to differentiate responsibly sourced products. You may have seen uh, last year that the London Metal Exchange plans low carbon aluminum. Uh, our customers, some of them uh, small and big, are shifting to having sustainable uh, sustainable separated products. And what's interesting about this is not that all of that the their other products are unsustainable, it's that, that we know more information about the ones that are uh, sustainably sourced, that they're that we've got tracking on. And this helps them to separate them out from just sort of the anonymous commodities that are out there. The reason this is interesting for me is that uh, the the global market has always been and companies that are responsible have historically been at a disadvantage. They've got higher costs. They've got, uh, they, they've got more work to do. It costs resources to be responsible, to pay your workers fairly, uh, to deal with your waste products properly. And a lot of the information about all of the good work the company has done gets lost in the supply chain because uh, the purchasers end up seeing two products on a shelf uh, or two products in their in, in their the, the exchange and they can't tell the difference. So how can we fix that? That was how we got started with Mind Spy. Uh, we also see that the in addition to companies seeing this need to move to a sustainable future, that there are new regulations that are coming into play. And these regulations are being driven by consumer demand. We we want to avoid slavery in our supply chain. We want to avoid forced labor, child labor. Um, and the big one, of course, that everyone is aware of is that we, we have to deal with carbon pollution. Carbon emissions are uh, right now at a crisis point. Uh, every, <laughs> everyone is talking about them and, uh, and is rightfully concerned. But how do we get better data on this? How can we control this? The, the, the only way is to have intervening and guiding regulation to not only uh, uh, force everybody onto a level playing field, but also to, uh, and to encourage a race to the top, but also to protect our companies and our businesses. Uh, because increasingly, the companies that don't um, act in a more responsible way are going to be rejected by both financiers and by the public. So. The challenge that we have right now is that responsibility is pure cost. It doesn't appear on the bottom line. And, and anyone who's dealt in this area knows uh, of this problem that's referred to as the tragedy of the commons. 
that if you can privatize profits and socialize losses, if you have one area that uh, that that isn't charged, such as pollution, carbon emissions, where it's not being uh, enforced, then the the nature of our economic system will force us uh, towards irresponsibility, because companies that foster sustainable business practices are at a disadvantage. They just have higher costs. So how can we avoid this? Uh, is there a future? that where uh, raw materials and especially metal is a trusted product and not just bought and sold in office. So this brings us to where we approached the problem. We started by asking, you know, how, what are the challenges to transparency and traceability in the supply chain? And we started, and you may have seen presentations on this before, the, the idea is a linked certificate system, okay? So what we do is we create digital certificates that link together at every stage of the supply chain from responsible mine, transport, smelter, manufacturer, collecting data that companies along the chain are proud of. The, the, everyone that we work with is proud of the products. They've got metal that maybe has a, a better process, a lower carbon emission, a better grade. Um, or maybe they've done a lot of worker safety. And they've, got, uh, they've got responsibility awards. Uh, or at very least uh, licenses from the government, ISO certifications, and all of that data adds value to their products. So what we do is we secure these, uh, th these data in digital certificates that are stored on the blockchain. Now, I don't know how familiar you all are with blockchain, but you can think of it as a way of creating unique digital items. When I say unique digital items, you, you, you think maybe uh, of a digital item as a movie or a sound file, a, a picture that can be copied 100,000 times. What if you knew which of those pictures was the original and which were copies? That's essentially what, what blockchain is. It's a way of doing that without a central control. Uh, and without getting into too much detail as to how it works, the idea is you can have forge and tamper-proof digital items that everyone can be confident are unchangeable, not duplicatable, and are the originals. So what can we do with a unique digital item? Well, the most common use case is it can store value. And so you may have seen that Bitcoin right now is uh, at... 50,000 US dollars per Bitcoin. And uh, it can store value because you know there are a limited number of real original Bitcoins and you can't duplicate them. Uh, you can't spend them twice. What we do is we deal with uh, a different type of value. We deal with this certification value. We deal with the unchangeable nature of these digital items to create certificates. Now, it's not that we are a certifier, we're a tech company. We don't go to mines and say, hey, you're responsible, you're not. What we do is we collect data that these mines and smelters I believe is valuable. We can collect scans of their, uh, of their certificates. Uh, of, um, we can collect data on bags and bag numbers when it comes out of, a, out, out of the ground and into, a, uh, into the crushers, into the concentrates and as it goes down the supply chain until it goes into the smelter. And we can say, yeah, there's a chain of custody that, uh, th that exists. Now it would have a lot of the benefits of a paper certificate in that it's difficult to copy or change and you know, you know it might have security features in it, uh, but it also has a lot of the elements of uh, the benefits of a digital item in that you can connect it to the previous owner. You can uh, split it into a thousand pieces and send it along with, uh, with uh, a split shipment. You can combine multiple certificates together and say that this is now an amalgamation. And so there's a lot of flexibility there uh, in giving people more information to make better decisions. Okay. So now uh, the idea is that if we have better data 
and people can make more informed decisions, then sustainability is no longer a, a, a pure cost to the responsible. It's a cost of doing business. Now, I want to, you to imagine as a consumer that you go and you want to buy a phone. And you go and you look at uh, a phone and you've got maybe two, three, four different phones. We all know that, as, uh, that no matter which phone we buy, uh, probably some of the metal in that phone comes from a not responsible source. We sort of close our eyes to it because we don't really have much power uh, to, to really make a difference. And maybe some of us have bought a fair phone because they try really hard to be fair, but they, it's, they still have trouble. And so um, the problem is that companies have the same issue. Companies to buy a battery for a phone or metal for solder or uh, or, or, or metals for, for screens uh, would also run into this issue that they only see one level of their supply chain. And they might see some certificates or certifications, but they don't have it connected down the chain. So the, the, and what ends up happening, because companies are not monolithic, they're made up of multiple departments and different groups, is that you'll have sustainability departments that go to great lengths to be responsible to ask where is this coming from what conditions uh, uh, under what conditions has it been produced but then you've got the purchasing department the purchasing departments uh, really don't have uh, have that same uh, motivation they if they don't get discounts and they don't get the best price then they have trouble uh, with their jobs so an auto uh, about the root causes of forced labor in the supply chain. And one of the root causes is that every year they will, their purchasing department will phone their suppliers and say, you know us really well, you're probably more efficient. Maybe you can give us a 10% discount next year. And they always say yes, because they're a big client. But how do they give that discount? Well, they phone their suppliers and say the same thing. And these discounts ripple down until eventually it gets to someone who says, I can give you a 10% discount next year. I just have to make these people work for free. And no one sees the direct impact. It, it is a systemic problem. And that's why, and, 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 and you have to understand that because the, they have to compete in the market. If they don't get their 10% discount, then maybe everybody else will and then they will have a problem competing. And so that, uh, and, and, and no one wants to lose their jobs, no one wants to lose their markets, no one wants to lose their contracts. And so you end up having a race to the bottom. If you have traceability, if you have uh, a way of integrating this type of responsibility data and provenance data into the baseline of what, uh, what needs to happen in order to manufacture, then it becomes a cost of doing business and instead you have a race to the top. That's the thesis. So enough blah, blah. Let's take a look at a blockchain. So I've got here in front of you a QR code that you can scan. And what this QR code links to is a MindSpider certificate. It's a certificate that I set up. It's not live customer data, don't worry. Uh, we set it up to be uh, uh, valid for uh, a fake thousand kilograms of tin, however, uh, it, from responsible mine one. However, what it does is that uh, it has a uh, URL to a short video about MindSpider, about 30 seconds long. What's interesting about this uh, and what it shows you is that uh, this is public information, what you see. But a MindSpider certificate is actually built of layers. We've got public information, transparency information, which is visible to uh, a company, their customers, their customers' customers, and so on down the supply chain, and private information. Private information being visible to you and your immediate customer. And so by dividing these, uh, this data into layers, we're able to permission it, even though there's not a, not a central database that we're in charge of. And that's what the certificate looks like. So what happens is that we work with uh, smelters that attach these QR codes to their shipments of uh, metal going out of the, uh, to their customers. Their customers can scan it, see the public information, and then log in with, to see the transparency and private information. 
Now, if they log in with a, you know, with a different account, let's say they're a regulator. Let's say they're a dock worker. Let's say they're a random person on the street. Random person on the street can scan this QR code too and see the public information. But if they log in with an account that's not the recipient account, they don't have access to the other information, but they can request it. Why is this important? Because if I sell a ton of metal to you and you say, I'm busy, I don't want to do anything with this blockchain, and you just sell the metal and don't touch the blockchain, your customer might scan that QR code and request the access to the information. And so then we can create a chain of custody, even if someone decides not to participate, we haven't broken the chain. This is how the, the layers work in practice. Um, it's just a, a, a short visualization. The way we've done it is we, if you want to get slightly technical, is that when you upload data to the private and transparency layers, we encrypt that and we get passwords or keys to access those two layers. And then we encrypt the keys with the public key of the owner. So that means that the next person will receive a set of keys and access those, uh, those areas of the certificate, even though there's not like a central Google or a central Amazon or a central um, uh, SAP controlling everybody in the supply chain. That's really important so that everyone has sovereignty over the data that they control and they put on the, on the chain. So how can these certificates help? I, I've talked a lot about certificates. I haven't talked about what's in there. They are, they are layered, they're uh, secure, but actually they're very flexible. What we 